Body Zero, Radical Preparation for the Return of Christ, Chapter 2, Radical Messianic Eschatology. Okay, so let's start this chapter by imagining a scene. I want you to imagine a pastor stood on a platform, stood behind a really cool lectern. One of those lecterns that you just think that's a really cool lectern. And in front of him are 2,000 men, 2,000 faces. 2,000 fathers, 2,000 sons, husbands, 2,000 Christian men listening to the pastor stood behind the cool lectern reading a book about men, two men. And you've got 2,000 people and you've got people up in the order to, uh, the top of the auditorium listening with a coffee. You've got people maybe peeking in through the side doors who haven't been able to get a day ticket. And people are listening, riveted, to the pastor speaking about a book written for men. And everyone's loving it except perhaps at least one person or two who are secretly, quietly in distress. The next day, after the end of the men's conference, imagine a scene now in church and the same pastor stood on the same platform, stood behind the same cool lectern, is reading a letter of complaint that was written and submitted in good faith by a delegate, one of the 2,000 faces that had been there the previous night. And the letter of complaint was basically asking a question, which is why the Bible hadn't been opened. In other words, why the Bible hadn't been taught. And even though the letter had been written by this gentleman in, in good faith, it was being read to the church to make the point that these guys, these other paying delegates who have come to the conference just don't get it. This way of thinking about the Bible is just so old school. And yet of course the gentleman who'd written the letter of complaint was completely right. The Bible hadn't been opened. The Bible hadn't been taught to 2,000 men, 2,000 Christian men who'd come to listen to the word of God. And of course that gentleman was correct, he was right to complain and the banter associated with that letter being read out in one of the biggest churches in this country, one of the most popular churches in this country, is far from being cool. If you think about the average delegate, average male delegate that would have been coming to a conference like that, probably knackered from life, often life is just far too much, he probably had a job he was probably leading a church of some kind or he was involved in some kind of ministry and often it just all feels too much. He was probably a father. He might have even been a grandfather. According to research, there's, there's a half likely chance that he may have even been anxious or suicidal. He was a Christian sojourning man coming to a Christian church, to a Christian conference to receive the word of God. And instead of the living, active word of God, he was read to from a pastor, from a book written by a man about men. And so ultimately, what we're talking about here in terms of the second chapter of Body Zero, Radical Messianic Eschatology, is to do with culture. We're talking about cultures to do with the end of the world. Ultimately, this is a story about two competing cultures. We have on the one hand, as I've described, a seeker sensitive approach to church where everything is tailored for folk to come to church. It's an attractional form of church. Let's do church as well as we can, as cool as we can, as sensitive to the needs of the seekers as we can to get people to come. And the hope is that they'll hear the gospel. The hope is that they'll become mature. Jesus followers, Jesus lovers, AKA disciples. And then on the other hand, we have a kind of exclusive brethren type approach to the end of the world as a culture which is that we just kind of gather in quiet huddles on the pavements a little bit like Jehovah's Witnesses just hoping that our presence there is somehow testifying to the goodness and glory of Jesus and that the hope would be that people would hear the good news and come to faith and follow Jesus for themselves a kind of exclusive culture where it's not cool to wear flip-flops at church or you can't go to the cinema and have, or have a beer with your mates because it's just far too legalistic. And so we've got these competing cultures 
in this denominational matrix. We've got this smorgasbord, messed up church who on the one hand want to be so cool that they've lost their cutting edge in a culture that just is crying out for help. And then on the other extreme, you've got this exclusive, legalistic, controlling, and in some cases abusive culture. What we need is a radical messianic eschatology that forms brand new cultures that is neither of those, but in another sense is both and. So in radical messianic eschatology, you will have the love for the word of God. 2,000 men gathering around living, preached, taught word of God, gagging for the now word of God, gagging for the presence, gagging for that sense of the rhema coming from the logos. And so this call to repentance is from, these, from this spectrum, from this denominational spectrum. How can it ever be helpful or glorifying to God to have churches that are on the one hand gathering around Skittles and Yorkie bars and coffees and something that just, it all looks cool, it sounds perfect, the music's amazing, we're recording albums, we're, we're, we're beaming this message to the whole world, and yet you've got people, men of God, like the complaining gentleman who's just kind of shriveling in his chair. How can that be cool? And then you have people on the streets who are, who are failing to represent the joy and the life and the kingdom of God. And so Paul, that's where we're going to go now very quickly. Let's dive into Acts chapter 9. I want to just, in a sense, hold up Acts chapter 9 to you. Read it very quickly, not the whole chapter, just a couple of verses, but then ask you to imagine with me what happened in the life of Saul of Tarsus. He was kind of like the the golden boy of the Jews, the golden boy of the Pharisees. And overnight he went from golden boy to black sheep. So let's go into chapter 9 of Acts and just read the first few verses and see where we go. Just got your Bible. In verse 1 it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This is Paul. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were travelling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate or drank. This is, in a sense, Saul's body zero moment. This is a transformation so radical, so messianic, and so directly linked to the end of the world and Jesus' return that it's very difficult for us to take in. It's important to try and imagine that Paul was so entrenched, he was so kind of, in a sense, brainwashed into the Pharisaical order, the kind of strictest Pharisaic sect of the Jews at that time. Paul says later on in the New Testament, he kind of boasts as though if it was any good, if it was uh, to my benefit, he had more reasons than anyone else to boast. And he lists all these different things. Paul saw at the time was the man. And yet Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and transformed his thinking. It then says in Galatians that Paul didn't go and hang out with, with Peter and John and some of the other apostles, that he took himself off for three years to Arabia to, in a sense, process everything that had happened. It took him three years on his own before the Lord in that sense of the Kabod, the glory of God, the sense of just listening to Jesus, just reading the scriptures, everything in his brain, in a sense, in his spirit, in his heart, being rerouted from his previous order. That is a, is a beautiful example on a personal level for the writer, the main writer of the New Testament, who had gone through his own body zero, his own sense of repentance from the way that he thought it was right to proceed. It says in Proverbs 16 that there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. 
Paul Saul was on the road to death. He was persecuting the church and he was in utter hatred and enmity towards God. And yet Jesus was gracious, gracious enough to meet him and transform him. And so ultimately what we need is a new radical messianic eschatology that within all of this sees our cultures of church leaving behind that which isn't working and embracing a new messianic vision where we come to live with a real sense of Jesus' return. So let's just go to the last verse of that section of Acts 9. So it's actually Acts 9, verse 9. After Paul had had this encounter, which must have been petrifying, before Jesus, he lost his sight. If you imagine now just closing your eyes, a little bit Bartimaeus, close your eyes, like you can't, even if you open your eyes, it's still black. Everything is still like, how disoriented would you be? How utterly helpless? And, in, and dependent on others would you be? And so that was Paul's state, he must have been absolutely frightened. And it says that for three days he was without sight and neither ate or drank. And it's, it strikes me that there must have been in more, in more ways than one a sense of death in Saul as he became freshly commissioned as the, as the one to be called Paul. You know, that sense of three days without being able to see, almost like three days in a grave. And so ultimately that's what is going to happen, I believe, in the church before Jesus returns. There's going to be this rewiring of what it means to be a, a lover and a follower of Jesus. What it means for us to be eschatological. What it means for us to be, for there to be no gap between what we say we believe and how we live. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that the invitation of our lives is to draw near, knowing that your promise to us is that you will always draw near and you always initiate, we love because you first loved us. Thank you that you moved towards Saul in such grace and mercy when he was pouring out murderous threats while he was persecuting you, even though he didn't understand that. Thank you that you transformed his life to be one who would then say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Lord, I pray that in the churches up and down the length and breadth of the UK and in the other nations of the world, where there are cultures that are not harmonious, that are not faithful to your word and are not faithful to the type of radical, messianic and eschatological cultures that you mean us to be, I pray that you would raise men and women and children up to help exact that in those different churches. I pray that there would just be a sense of tiredness with these other models of churches that leave believers weak and ineffective for the kingdom and for your glory. We pray that there would be a fresh sense of a radical breakthrough into Christian cultures in the UK. In Jesus' name. <laughs>